everybody, welcome to this month's International Culinary Hour. We're going to cover Germany today, October, Oktoberfest. Um, I'm going to be making some Sauerbrand today, served with the side of roasted potatoes. Um, if you look at your first page on your handout, cover a couple of facts and figures. Uh, Germany is located in Western Europe with a varied topography that includes regions of deep forests, high mountains, and a wide valley surrounding the Rhine, Germany's largest river. A lot of wine production there too, a lot of grape production. Food has always placed a major part in German culture. King Frederick the Great, from 1712 to 1786, introduced the potato, which has since been the staple of the German diet. Um, he liked them so much, they actually took seed potatoes and distributed them out to all the people in the country, made sure that they planted all over Germany. After, after Germany lost World War I, food was scarce and soldiers trying to get home were starving. After World War II, the country had even less food available. But this time, the nations that had defeated Germany, including the United States, helped feed the Germans and rebuild the country. In 1949, Germany was divided into East and West Germany. This division caused the two halves of the country to develop different cooking styles. East Germany was closely associated with its neighboring country, Russia, and consequently assimilated the cooking methods and food of that country. West Germany continued the traditional German cuisine. Um, for today's demonstration, I'm obviously going to do the traditional German cuisine because um, West and East Germany, as we all know, amalgamated later on, so the kind of the Western culture kind of reintroduced the traditional, and that's kind of the, the, the standby to present-day Germany. Traditionally, Germans tend to eat heavy and hearty meals with ample portions of bread and meat. Potatoes are a staple throughout the country, and each region has its own favorite ways of preparing them. Uh, knodel, spetzel. Uh, knodel are basically potato dumplings, uh, which you would do two ways of doing it. You could boil them or fry them. Remember asparagus, we talked about this. Um, it's uh, basically you boil the potatoes, you mash them, and with the addition of breadcrumbs, some flour, and eggs, you pour them little dumplings and poach them. Uh, spetzel is kind of like, look at it as the German version of pasta. You make like a loose dough with mashed potatoes, nutmeg, and chives, <coughs> and you over colander, boil it in water, and then you saute and clarified butter. But to keep true to the traditional cuisine, I just did roasted potatoes today. Um, that's pretty much a standby all throughout Germany. Rye, pumpernickel, and sourdough breads are common, and soft pretzels can be found almost anywhere. Uh, the pretzel is known, you know the shape of the pretzel, like this? It was known to be developed by a German Catholic monk. Um, monks back traditionally used to pray like this. So basically, in the prayer, they go like this, so we developed the style of the dough to wrap it around twice, took like arms folded in prayer. That's where the pretzel had developed from. At German Oktoberfest, beer is traditionally drunk from steins where Germans imbibe over 5,000 different kinds of beer made from their more than 1,200 breweries. When eating in Germany, it is polite to have both hands above the table at all times, but elbows should not rest on the table. It is also considered impolite to leave food on the plate as well. Um, insult the cook because if you didn't finish the plate, it means the food was terrible, you didn't like it. So you either take what you want or finish everything in your plate. Pork, beef, and poultry are the main varieties of meat consumed in Germany. Pork being the most popular and the meat is usually braised. We're going to cover that today. A long tradition of sausage making exists in Germany with more than 1,500 different types of, different types. Uh, bratwurst is ground pork and spices. Blutwurst, also known as Wurstwurst, it's a, uh, blut is blood. So basically they would render the blood from your animal and they would use it as a thickening agent because actually when you cook the blood, it coagulates with the protein, so the sausage becomes very dark and black. So you take the meat, add the blood to it, and you poach it, so it looks like a black sausage, but actually the blood that coheres it. So that's very popular, actually. You use the blood of the animal. Blood first. Yes. And beaners, like hot dogs. Pork or beef that is then smoked and fully cooked in water bath are most popular. Breakfast commonly consists of bread, toast, cold cuts, cheeses, jam, honey, and eggs. The main meal of the day is lunch. Um, Traditionally it is. Um, nowadays, because of the working environment, it's not so much the case. It can be. Not, traditionally, the main meal is lunch. Eaten around noon, and dinner, dinner was always the smaller meal, often only consisting of breads, meats, sausages, cheese, vegetables, or sandwiches, and smaller portions, much like breakfast. The most popular herbs are parsley, thyme, laurel, chives, black pepper, juniper berries, nutmeg, and caraway. Juniper berries. Um, I'm going to pass this around. Big staple. You're going to see that in the um, marinade of the Zauberon today. You smell it, juniper berries, the derivative is gin. So if you take this, you also have a gin flavor. I'm going to take a smell and pass it around. 
Pass around. So if you take a deep small of that, they take the germ various fermentum, that's where they get gin from. Zauerbraten is made throughout the country with the subtle regional differences, but always made from a vinegar base. Zauerbraten is sour beef. I'm so going to go over there. Major ingredient, obviously, is going to be beef. Um, let me talk about this for a bit. This is where I'm getting the Zauerbraten from. Now, if you look at the cow, the whole cow, there's about eight what they call primal cuts. From those primal cuts is what they get, subprimal cuts. So, if I was a cow right now, standing on my hind legs, this would go right there. Okay? So, if I took the cow, if you're staring at it, the whole leg, if you had like your, my, let me go over here. If I cut from above my kneecap, and I go like a, a cut from my ilium, down to the pubis area like this, the hell of the H bone. So that, including the whole femur, all the meat that surrounds it, is called the round. That's a primal cut. So if you take the cow, if I take my leg, and I cut this, this is called the inside, or top round, or bottom or outside round. So this comes from the outside round. This cut includes three cuts. It's called the eye, the heel, and the, um, the bottom flat. So basically you can get like a, very cheap cut, obviously, because the leg is used a lot. So it's very um, tough, so it lends itself well to a grazing consistency. So what I'm going to do is, for this demonstration, only about five pounds of it, so I'm assuming about here. So you can see the muscles. Let me get the top part off. You can see there's a lot of fat you have to deal with. You don't get rid of the fat, it's going to end up in your sauce. And you're also looking for, because this has to marinate for three days, it's a very tough cut of meat. The vinegar, a lot of people, I think I touched on this once before, when you add vinegar or acid to a marinade, people think it breaks down the meat. Not necessarily true, what happens is, the vinegar actually attacks the protein fibers of the meat. And um, I kind of like uh, relate it to a rubber band. If you have like a rubber band, you put it in your mouth and chew on it, very chewy, and you can't break through it. But if you stretch the rubber band, then bite through it, you have an easier chance of breaking through it. So what the vinegar does, it actually tightens the meat fibers, makes them very tense. It's called shear strength. So what the vinegar does, increases the shear strength of the meat. So when your teeth go through that meat, they just break very easily. It gives the appearance of being tender actually tightens the meat up. So I'm going with the portion now where we got a five pound cut of meat. You can see right here this is what they call the silver skin. Now without removing the fat there's also an underlying connective tissue called the silver skin that if it's not removed the marinade would not penetrate that meat. So for the demonstration, we move about five, four pounds. I think the recipe goes for four pounds. Looks good. Now you see today when I serve it, I took this whole Gooseneck round, they call it three cuts of meat. Totally broke it down and I cut it lengthwise. So you'll see, it'll be easy for me to slice. So each one of these yields about, after it's fully fabricated, about um, two 10 pound pieces of meat. So I cook about 40 pounds of this. Um, so I did two of these, cut them in half lengthwise, and I braised them like, I'll show you how we do now. So we're pretty good to go, it's nice and clean. So now at this point in time where the silver skin is gone, there won't be much fat in the sauce. Let's we'll keep the marbling. Very tough cut of meat, so what happens is now the, the marinade has a chance to actually penetrate that meat. Without all that connective tissue on there, it wouldn't happen. All right? Get the pan going really high. I'm gonna work on the marinade. 
If you look at the top of your list on the third page, I believe your handout, you go with the water, cider vinegar, red wine vinegar, medium onion. You can see a lot of earthy spices towards the bottom bay leaf, cloves, juniper berries, and mustard seeds. First of all, we're going to work on the carrot and the onion. Cover this a couple times. After you do the proper way to dice an onion, I have to remove the outer layer of papery skin. Take a thin slice off the root end and the blossom end so that core is intact because that's going to help you. If I was going to slice it, sorry, right now. if I wanted to slice it, I would remove that with a V cut. But this is going to help me keep all the slices together. I'll show you. The core end always goes away from you. Move your slices down. Right now I have a whole bunch of what looks like julienne onions, but they're held together by that core. So now all I have to do is go down and cut like that. I'm not too really worried about the form of the carrot or the onion because in the finished product, um, this also will be strained anyway. Okay, at this point in time, the pan should be pretty hot. What I'm going to do is sear the meat. And searing the meat, covered it a couple times. Um, if I was to put that meat into the raw marinade, it wouldn't pick up much flavor. flavor. What I want to do is caramelize all the outside protein of this meat right here. And it's called a Maillard reaction. So when I do that, hundreds of little compounds are formed by the caramelization. So pork, chicken, each has their own little compounds inherent to that protein, that meat. So what happens when the heat hits that and you caramelize it, you're developing another flavor profile. Um, it, it, people think that there's an imaginary barrier that happens where you're sealing in juices. That's not the case at all. You're losing juices when you caramelize the meat. Only for color, flavor, and texture is why you're doing that. But because of the fact is that's going to be braised in a liquid medium, I don't have to worry about it drying out because it's constantly cooking in liquid. And as it sits in that broth later on, the juices will become part of the fibers of that meat later on before I slice it. So I'm going to season it first. A little salt, a little pepper. So we get the instant sear. What happens on that bottom of the pan is called the fawn. When developing flavors, crumbling is the meat with sticks to the pan, so it's going to leave to come part of my sauce. Um, as I showed you before, I have, let me wash my hands for a second. The juniper berries that I showed you is not part of the recipe, but I usually do this. Um, because juniper gin is derived from juniper berries, I like to deglaze the pan, add that to my marinade. So after the little brown, brown spot specks, I'll show you the six of the pan are right there. I'm going to deglaze with the gin and put that part of the sauce. This is the browning I'm talking about, the caramelization of the meat. That has a lot of flavor to your meat. So I have the fawn, which I told you about before, the caramelized meat proteins here. So I want to become that part of that sauce. I don't want to throw that out. I'll get rid of the residual oil. See right away that comes off the pan, becomes part of my sauce. Nice brown caramelized meat there. So I put that over here. We'll start with the marinade. 
And the marinade, zero brown, comes from sour beef. Obviously, it's going to be very sour because we have equal parts of vinegar and water. Uh, this particular recipe, I have one cup of cider vinegar and red wine vinegar with two cups of water. Because right here to start. Then add the drippings in the pan. As you proceed down, I'm going to add bay leaf. This parent is make sure I add everything. Add bay leaf. Pepper, uh, the kosher salt, this is whole cloves and the juniper berries, uh, mustard seed, mustard seed is usually used in pickling agents, uh, Germans don't know for the pickling, pickles too, um, very intense like yellow mustard is made from this, ground down to a paste, um, very earthy flavors, nice. And that is it for now, so what happens is you're going to get this nice blast of vinegar in the air. I don't know if you can smell it yet, a little bit. So what this does, instead of just making a cold marinade, which a lot of people do, this actually releases a lot of the essential oils from the bay leaf, the mustard seed, and from you know the peppers and things like that. So what happens is I'm releasing it now through heat, and as I chill it down the walk-in, or the refrigerator where we have, that gets poured over the beef. Now this beef has got to be served, it's got to be marinated at least at least three days um, to get a proper flavor. Um, so <coughs> Uh, mm -hmm. The one I'm going to serve you right now has been married for a couple days. Um, definitely picks up. You'll see, like when you slice it, there should be a, like a almost like a smoke ring, as if you smoke the meat, but like a a ring that kind of like permeates the outside of the meat. You're going to taste like a very intense sourness of the meat, sour brine. Um, also, it's a way also because of the vinegar, it's a way to preserve. A lot of times they purchase a lot of meat through meat fabrication, and they had like a lot of pieces left over to to avoid it going bad and spoiling they would um, actually preserve it in a nice salt and acid bath, pickling. It would preserve the meat a lot longer. So. This is a nice sauce too because typ typically, like French style, you do something like a roux, which is a butter flour thickener. But after this meat has marinated in here for three days, all you have to do is place the whole thing in your oven, braise it for about three and a half, four hours, until it's like tender, and what happens is you strain the whole sauce, the vegetables are done, and you um, pulverize some ginger snaps, ginger cookies for the thickener. So the flour is actually thickens that sauce. Mm -hmm. And then what you do is you um, strain that a second time, that becomes your sauce. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any questions? Nothing. <laughs> did I get everything on that list? Yeah, I did? <laughs> <laughs> Except the raisins. Okay, the, oh, the raisins. Um, the raisins. I cooked that myself. So what happens is, after the meat is marinated for three days, you take it out. And as it's cold, so you want to reheat this again before you pour over the meat. And that's when you add the sugar that's in that recipe. And the sweetness, so it have a sweet and sour effect. And then when you strain it after the ginger snap thickens, it, then you add your raisins for garnish on top of that. So they puff up a little bit. Add a little extra sweetness to it. Um, nice flavor. And that's pretty much the procedure. I'm going to serve it now. You're going to show you right now what I have. So basically what you have here is that eye round, like I told you about the slice lengthwise, so I have about four portions like this after they come down. Wow. And then we'll slice that, we'll shingle that, and I'll show you the sauce. Also run the risk of um, picking up too much acid oh. in, in that meat. 
It's, it's a very lean meat, so it'll be very susceptible to attack from the acid. So if you do it like more than three days, you you run the risk of being very like, you want like a sweet and sour kind of effect of the meat. Um, if that happens, it kind of like, um, it can over, over marinate the meat, which that means it becomes really mushy after you cook it. You don't get like uh, any texture to it. It's almost like they're chewing on a sponge kind of. Oh, okay. In effect, yeah. So basically, is that marinade was strictly water and vinegar, but the addition of the ginger snaps makes it very thick, as you'll see the gravy. So you pick up a nice um, ginger sweet flavor. So look for sour and sweet when you taste the meat. Eric, did you think of the ginger snap thing, or is that no? That's pretty traditional. That traditional. It is. It's pretty traditional, yeah. Um, so some have done it like without the thickener. So I've seen recipes where it's prepared with the regular. Um, butter and flour is a thickener and they add like a pulverized ginger things like that but this is pretty good because the fact is um, the beef itself even though it's semi lean I like to keep that beef fat instead of the butter fat because it adds to the sauce uh, the flavor of the sauce um, it doesn't have as much um, like a, a smoother sheen texture but it has the intense has more of a beef flavor so I'm using the beef fat basically so the ginger snaps when they're added being very dry and hydrous will suck up all that fat and end up incorporating it into that sauce Whereas like a flour and butter is kind of like bland, you know, so I'm using beef fat in place of like butter and flour for the most part. But most recipes go for the ginger snaps now. Because Did they just you use the pot roast meat for this or not? Yeah, you can use this pot roast too. Okay. Yeah, um, anything on that round lends itself well to moist heat cooking. Yeah. Stew, if I cut this into cubes, it would make a great stew. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> pot roast is fine, anything like that. Anything like that, we're going to braise the meat. When you're braising the meat, all you want is like make sure the meat is covered in the pan just to fit the meat. As long as the liquid is about halfway to three quarters of the size of the meat, you know you have enough for service, it's enough to cook the meat. So halfway through, you flip it over and do the other half. So when you're braising or making a stew like that. Where does the pot roast part of the... Um, that, that, that pot roast can be any cut of meat. It could be the eye round. It could be the, it, it could be the oh, full... Oh, it's in part it, of that? It's in part of that? A pot roast is actually just... is like if I'm making a pot roast, you can use a different cut of meat. You can use eye round, you can use... Um, bottom round, inside round, it doesn't matter. Oh, pot roast is, is the method of what you're making. Oh, it is. Yeah, oh, this okay. indicates the method of cooking. Yeah. Oh, okay. Pot roast isn't like a, doesn't mandate a particular cut of meat. Okay. Yeah. So. Yes? Do you put uh, poke holes in it so when it, it's marinating, it gets inside the meat? Do I what? Poke holes in it to see if Yes, it I did. Yeah. Yep. So the, a little bit, I did. Mm -hmm. I sure did, yep. Good. Yeah, we talked about that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I did. We talked about that. I made sure. <laughs> I sure did. Let's say the same one. Lamb roast, poke a little garlic in there. Same thing. Help the marinade get in there. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm going to serve this with traditionally roasted potatoes. What I did was a little. Oil and thyme on those. You're going to taste that up quick. I'm going to make sure my name is a chart. What do you pull that hair? I'm going to make sure you This is a nice slicing knife. Very smooth on the side. So. Very thin slices. Try to go against the grain as much as you can. I can see here. That's much fat, it's cartilage. It's a nice, ends with like a lot of flavor to the sauce as well, so.
go. That's finished plate right there.